This week, Dave Bluter, author of The Great Gamble, talks about how important character development is in a plot-driven novel. I'm a plot person. It took me a lot of time to really figure out and dive into how to develop character. It's gotten really interesting for me over the years. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my mother and co-host, Caroline Coburn. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood today. <laughs> it is, and I think we're all kind of in the neighborhood because our guest today is in, I believe, Iowa City, Iowa. and oh. Very close. Very, very close. close. Okay, and I'm in Fairfield, and Caroline's in Mount Pleasant, so we're all in southeast Iowa even. So, 71 degrees here. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that gorgeous for August? Can you believe it? I mean, that's oh. kind of not even real. <laughs> no, it's not. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> okay. Right. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. So, speaking of you something know, that's Yeah, really. Something that's not even real. Boy, this book, if it's if the, what's going on in this book is real, that's a little scary, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, Our, it is. The well, book it, is called The Great Gamble, At What Price? And it's a thriller by Dave Bluter. And David is, he holds a degree in business from Northern Iowa University and received his MBA at St. Ambrose. Before becoming an author, David was a banker, politician, business owner, and investor, as well as taught business policies at the University of Iowa. And he currently lives with his wife, Lisa Bluter, who has been the University of Iowa women's basketball coach for 20 years and three children. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Dave. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I'm very excited to be here. So where exactly are you if you're not, you're not in Iowa City, but you're close? Well, I'm in Solon, and oh. uh, we're in the Solon district, uh, but we're kind of in between Solon and Iowa City, uh, stuck in, uh, in 10 acres in the woods. Oh, wow. Well. In the wilderness. Oh. <laughs> I lived in Solon for, it uh, wasn't quite a year. Uh, hmm. My daughter was born when we lived there in 1980. Long time. Ago. Oh my! Yeah, and it's grown tremendously since then. It's just amazing the growth wow. that we've had. Well, when I when I oh, lived that. there, we moved there when I was like eight months pregnant, and mm -hmm. there was a brand new doctor mm -hmm. in town who the mm -hmm. town had sort of paid to bring him there because they didn't have a doctor. Now you're only what ten, fifteen mm -hmm. miles from Iowa City, but they didn't have a doctor yeah. in town, and they wanted it. so they had sort of set up a um, clinic for him to come and he was mm. just out of medical school and I was my daughter was the first baby he delivered on his own oh, well, that's oh. terrific <laughs> <laughs> good oh my I bet he that's remembers nice that to too he might he might I wonder if he's and it ha well it, it, the story is even more interesting because uh, she was born the day after Christmas I woke up. I knew I was in labor. My husband was not home. He was um, doing a construction project about in Davenport, I think. And I had a doctor appointment that morning, went over. My neighbor took me over to the doctor. He took one look at me, said, we're going to the hospital. He drove me to the hospital. <laughs> and he drove fast because he knew that he didn't have much time. And by the time we got there, she was born less than an hour later. So. <laughs> oh my! Oh my! So he well, probably does. Well, I'm you, glad we're yeah. close. We're close. Yeah. Bowen is very close. Yeah. yeah we're 20 yeah. minutes away. So, so Dave, very nice. the great gamble. Sure. Uh, it's about gambling, sports gambling. Why? Why write a book? You know, what? What about this drew your interest, and how realistic is it? Well, uh, it's uh, something that I thought about uh, approximately about a decade ago, about 10 years ago. And my wife's been uh, the women's basketball coach for 20 years and uh, spent a lot of time watching games and sports and talking to referees and coaches and ex-players. And uh, at the time, about 10 years ago, there was an NBA referee that actually uh, was accused and 
uh, actually committed the crime of shaving points. And a point shaving means that uh, if uh, X, Y, Z, T, X, Team X is supposed to win by 12 and they only win by 10, you could put uh, a half a million dollars on that game and, and win uh, if, you, if, if it's a 10-point game instead of a 12-point game, which is the actual line or Vegas number says so. But, but it's a, it, you know, it's a lot more than just sports and gambling. I've, I had somebody actually sent me um, a note last week that it's, it's pretty involved with a lot of other uh, subjects. And when you open the book, um, you'll see five black and white photos. And publishing thought it would be interesting to, to um, kind of throw those in because you've got sub stories or subplots and one of them is about numerology and it's one of the referees he's kind of exposed into a life of the paranormal and to the occult mm-hmm. and that's an interesting mm-hmm. story into itself um, the second is a picture of Mona Lisa so there is uh, inside the book uh, an, an interesting story about a, a discovery of a major art theft that happened in the United States uh, from the Isabel Gardner Museum in, in Boston, which is still hasn't been recovered. And uh, it's in fact, it was just in uh, business week uh, about two weeks ago is still the unknown caper of art, the art world has never been resolved. And that's, uh, that's shown in the book. There's a, there's a picture of a window uh, there's a revelation of a hidden area in, in an iconic United States landmark. Um, then we take you to uh, uh, Mexico and some other places, and then there's a shocking scandal that leads to an international manhunt. And then finally, there's um, a picture, a photo of what's called cryptos, and it's outside the FBI building um, in Lang- Langley, Virginia. And there's also one in Iowa City in, in, the, um, in one of the buildings, and that's a picture called a cryptos picture, uh, or actually a sculpture, excuse me. And it's an FBI investigation that incorporates that famous cryptos encryption, which hasn't been able to be broken or hacked um, over the years. And everybody's been trying to do it, hackers. Uh, supercomputers, and uh, that's been in, actually in the news uh, the last uh, couple of weeks as well. So all this, oh you know, all these different stories um, that a sports fan or any anyone will never be able to watch a game the same way again. And uh, publishing has kind of tried to say that the, the great gamble is, is being billed as the biggest secret in America. Well, I was one, you know, I wondered about that, you know. I'm not a sports fan, but I don't think mm-hmm. I could ever watch a game again and really enjoy it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a yeah, hidden, I, I, uh, yeah. explosive yeah. kind of revelation that gets uncovered. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Well, I, yeah. I went to Iowa uh, and um, back in the day, yeah, in the 50s, and um, I knew I knew some of the basketball players. And um so, you know, that that was even funny, even more interesting to me, you know, wondering if they were, I never heard them say anything about it, but, you know, mm-hmm. you just wonder, you wonder how, you wonder how long this has been going on. Well, it has been going on for a great amount of time. I've done a lot of research, uh, goes back to some of the times when Tom Davis, uh, Coach Tom Davis was at Boston college and uh that was a huge heist uh, back then and it's just been going on and on and I've, the more I, I dive into it the more i see it and, and try to uncover it but the nice thing that you know one of the things that we wanted to talk about is again it's just not just sports it has to do with the subtitle of the book and then the subtitle is called at what price and mm-hmm. that whole thing mm-hmm. revolves revolves around Adam uh, who there's an old Hungarian proverb that said Adam ate the apple and our teeth still ache and yeah. uh, you know it's the first human conflict why did Adam partake in that apple uh, it was the only tree in the entire garden that was off limits at what price do we choose incorrectly so I've been trying to tell people that you know we have a story storyline that says um, if I give you an example of Demi Moore, who was in uh, Indecent uh, Proposal, uh, the movie that came out a few years ago, 
she was in dire financial need. It goes to Vegas to try to find um, uh, money for her dream house. And the uh, billionaire shows up by the name of Robert Redford. And he comes to the rescue and he's offering her a million dollars to spend the night with him. And, uh, and then the results, as we all know, became very complicated. And then a lot of people say, well, maybe the price of concession isn't a million dollars, nor would I strongly think about that proposal. Um, however, but uh, at what price, for example, if your family was starving, you were out of work for any number of reasons, um, and would you steal a loaf of bread to feed your family? I don't know, how long does it take you to think about that? Of course you uh -huh. would. If you would. And the decisions every day that we make come at a great cost. And one of the protagonists, we have a few of them in the book, is Jason Carson. He's the number one high school basketball recruit in the country, and his skill is immense. He's 6'9", he's handsome, he's getting scholarships from all over the country, but he's in a quandary. His mother is a single parent. She has ovarian cancer. She has no health insurance. They're about to lose that uh, crummy rundown apartment in Oak Park, Illinois, and then there's a guy, that, uh, an agent that's been watching him over here. His name's Ricardo Fred. And uh, unlike some of the uh, Mexican cartels, confident, sophisticated, but aggressive, compassionate agent who um, has been pursuing Jason for months. And this guy was kind of interesting. He's into the arts. He's a very interesting man, but uh, he's also brutal. And he delivers this kind of serendipitous proposal to Jason, who has run out of choices, he offers him a secret loan to pay off his bills with only a handshake. And it's paid back when Jason's going to sign his gigantic NBA contract. But um, Perez appears and asks for a small point shaving from Jason in return, and that's when some of the games begin. It points out the the problems for some of these athletes who are mm -hmm. they're looking at potentially being very very wealthy, but until they get to that point, and there's all these rules set up around when they can go pro and so forth. Sometimes they're mm -hmm. very poor, and it, how it's hard to resist the kind of the perks that come mm -hmm. from being athletes, and also other people are making a ton of money off of them, and they're not exactly. making any for what they're doing even though they could get seriously injured and not right. ever be able to make money from from what they're doing. And so it's kind of, you wonder, is there a better way to handle this? I don't know. What do you think? Well, that's a great question. In fact, you've seen some you know, changes in, in whether players should get paid in college and you know, to what extent, and, you know, everybody's trying to grab the cash. Um, but then you also have people, not just the players, but you have referees that are involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have one of another protagonists <laughs> that's in the story is the narcissist uh, referee, Tim McMurray, and he's hemorrhaging from, you know, life of yeah. the occult along with changing the outcomes of games and, and being threatened by in deadly and unthinkable ways. Um, and then oh, the yeah. FBI gets involved. So you've got all kinds of things that that are involved here, and it just leads to just a major level of corruption. And even Jason's and high other... school coach was, you know, <laughs> of course, everybody from a right. yeah. from the college, yeah. you know, getting he was going to make a little make a little dough if Jason went to the college that was paying him. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One of the problems I see is that some of these like Jason, he's not really too good at school, not at schoolwork. I mean, he's he's having he's right. really struggling, and so that right. you know that's got to be really difficult for that for that kid because he knows right. he's got to do well, and but he just can't because he doesn't you know exactly. So, and you know, people you know that with some great talent seem to get pushed along in the system, and that's another part of the story as well. That this kid mm -hmm. gets, you know, he's been such a mm -hmm. great athlete. He just gets pushed, and he can't even read because of some dyslexia problems. And then, and then we happen mm -hmm. to uh, get into a kind of interesting love affair or in friendship uh, with the female basketball player, and that's kind of an interesting story in itself. It is, yeah. I mean, this this yeah. idea of the kids getting pushed along in high school, 
you know, that's been going on for a long time, and it happens at, at really pretty low levels, too. It's not just the superstar who's going to make it to the NBA someday. It's, you right, know, it's right. the top football player in the small right. rural school in Iowa who doesn't, who exactly. probably won't even play at a big college. You know, he's not that talented, but for that school, right. he's the star. And exactly. gets favored treatment, and and the thing is that favored treatment isn't really doing them a favor in the long run. Exactly, and that's a great another great part of the story. I mean, how many kids do you know, uh, you know, or did you grow up with that were in your high school, or or you know that was a star at something, and then they end up being, you know not amounting to much and then they, all they want to talk about is the high school days for the rest yeah of that life. was the highlight the high point of their lives you know right yeah we allow that to happen yeah. and that's and that's yeah it's a cultural thing yeah scoring the winning touchdown is and and a dollar will get you a cup of coffee 20 years right. later <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> depends on where you're getting your coffee <laughs> that's right that's right oh golly so you're listening to Writer's Voices, and our guest today is Dave Bluter, author of The Great Gamble, At What Price? The other thing, of course, is that Jason's mother is ill, and that, that puts a lot of burden on him, too. I mean, this poor, it's a, this is a page-turner, because I wanted to know, I really wanted to know what happened to him, you know, how he's going to do this, because mm -hmm. he doesn't know how to handle these criminals that are, you know, it's just like a bunch of dogs yapping at him. And, oh, mm -hmm. oh gosh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it was well done. It was well done. It really was. And why does Thank he you. want and, so many shoes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spend money on shoes. Well, do you want to ask my yeah. wife? Or my, I mean, of course, I might be as bad. In fact, there's all kinds of, you know, Mel DeMarco's stories out there, thousands of shoes that, uh, Females wear what he well he likes the shoes as well. In fact, there's it's a it's an interesting industry that there are people that have all of the uh, you know the shoes, especially sports, and they're very expensive. Le My wife Lisa has has had a player uh, that played for her uh, at the University of Iowa. Now she is an a, an assistant athletic director at uh, Yale University, and she has all of the Jordan. Uh, Jordan, whatever shoes that they came out uh, every year, she had them going back till I think 1984, 85 when they first came oh out. So yeah, oh. some people have <laughs> people have uh, high arches and can jump high. So it's, a, it's just another <laughs> thing that we do that we're not supposed to do. <laughs> oh gosh. So is this your first book, Dave? Uh, it is, and it started uh, 10 years ago. Um, it's kind of a great story in itself. Uh, I kind of got the idea, which I talked about a little bit earlier, and then I went to see Jim Harris at uh, Prairie Lights, and I said, Jim, I'm thinking about writing a book. And, uh, you know, he gave me that eye, and then and I said, well, I've kind of started, but <laughs> I started reading all the craft books, you know, how to, how to, if I start with the um, Gotham's Writers Workshop, um, uh, how to book from uh, New York City, and then um, he said, "Well, get started, read some books, and then go see." Um, I've got an editor that went through the Iowa Writers Workshop, so I did. I called him, and uh, he started taking a look at some of the, my paper, my uh, manuscripts, and then I would start taking classes in the winter or summer at the Iowa Writers Iowa Writers Festival in Iowa City, which is a great, great program. Um, has a lot of the uh, professors or uh, teachers that actually went through the Iowa Writers Workshop, so you get a, kind of an, uh, some great help there. I continued to read uh, different books and different styles, different genres. Then I and then I kept reading some other you know uh, craft books, and in the meantime, you know we just kept looking and going through uh, manuscripts. And I found another uh, editor that uh, also helped me he was he actually went through uh the stanford writers workshop he lives in new york city and so he helped me as well and then after about 10 drafts 
uh, we decided it was ready. <laughs> ten drafts in ten years. <laughs> and oh, wow. uh, have do you still have a day job? Uh, I don't. Um, my wife's working full time. I've kind of been taking care of the kids. I'm working on some investment stuff all the time. I've been doing some volunteering and. So, um, no, not, not full-time. Is writing something that you always wanted to do? Um, I think so. I'm just one of those people that I've always enjoyed it. I enjoyed the actual written word, um, the poetry of it, uh, the story of it. I'm a plot, I'm a plot person. So this is pretty plot heavy. So it kind of took me some time. It took me a lot of time to really figure out and dive into how to develop character. And uh, yeah. uh, that really got interesting and it's gotten really interesting for me over the, over the years. But, and so now every time I, I see or read or, or engage with someone, I really understand a lot more the depthness of every person that we encounter and uh, that's one of the cool things about reading, that you kind of learn how the world is so different and how we how we uh, look at it in different ways. So I'm I'm curious, are you an athlete yourself? Um, yeah, I, I love sports, and uh, in fact, I played tennis today for two hours. It was beautiful outside. So yes, I. Oh. Um, but but I just like the complexity of it all. The the interest, why people are so interested in it. Why do people, you know, 70,000 people show up to an Iowa football game? Is it just the game itself or what are all the intricacies Uh and all the other sub stories that are involved in it? And that's what gets kind of interesting to me. So you probably have a lot of material to mine in for future stories. I I did. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm writing a uh, international political thriller right now with China and Russia Ooh. and the United States and and uh, a lot of crazy things that are happening. That we're seeing a lot of crazy things now anyways, but I've got a whole other group of things that I've been, I think, <laughs> going to happen. So it's kind of futuristic in a way of some things that could, that will actually, I think, are going to take place. So. Oh. And and it's pretty scary. I know it's you mentioned now. that your son plays basketball um, because we mm-hmm. had to reschedule this interview because he had a game. <laughs> Did you? Do you have any fear if he's really talented that he might face some of these issues in the future? Um, that's a really good point. You know, you spend so much time thinking about it. He's going to be a senior this year. Um, he is a really, really good shooter. He's a big score um he's only you know i'm saying he's only six five so you know, to <laughs> only. Be big, <laughs> only big program some of these guys need to be six seven six eight six ten you know so um like jason carson is by the way um but you know i think he's kind of looking more at school he'd like to play basketball but find a school first because he's not going to play in the nba so you know it'd be you know, wonderful to get him into a great school first and then let him play basketball at that school. Mm-hmm. Now, I know the University yeah. of Iowa has a, has had a history of um, issues with gender discrimination in sports. And, you know, with your wife being a coach there, did you ever, did that mm-hmm. play into this? There's a little bit, there, you touch on it a little bit in here about how the male mm-hmm. athletes get a lot more favored treatment maybe than the female ones. Um, but is there is there more depth to that story too? Well, I'm 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 very impressed that you're able to kind of read into some of that at times. Um, and I wanted to kind of show that as well from some of the equality uh, situation. My wife's been fighting she's been she's been fighting for equality in sports and gender equity in all issues since uh, she started as head coach when she was 23 years old at St. Ambrose University. She, um, oh my goodness. she lucked out. Uh, yeah. Her first job, she got paid $2,400 a year to be the head coach at St. Ambrose. <laughs> and uh, that wow. story in itself is pretty amazing. Um, how she continued. 
how she originally didn't want to do it because of the money. And uh, I kind of pushed her into it. Um, and then, and then, and then she was kind of able to work her way up by just working incredibly hard and doing a good job, doing a great job and winning games as well as, you know, doing more than anybody else. So it is part of that story. Um, and, and you see that it kind of gets peeled away as to how, what kind of money is involved in male sports and some of the things that the female sees. So you, you do get to see that picture as well. So, yeah, you're, that's really, um, really an interesting thing that you picked up on. That sounds like a good uh, a good start for another novel, I think. <laughs> well, that is kind of interesting. I might have to think about that, too. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. And right now, isn't there some controversy at Iowa about uh, uh, how the, the, the uh, um, African-American students are being – or players are being uh, bullied or not – Something I I couldn't really understand what was going on, but there's something going on there. Yeah, there was just some uh, some things that came out on social media um, about the uh, football team, and uh, so the football team has uh, has released their um, strength and conditioning coach, and uh, then the report just came out um, just a few days ago. Uh, to try to make sure that uh, things are all um, corrected and we're back on the the right track. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah. So, Dave, with The Great Gamble, um, you have a lot of great endorsements for this book. Um, one mm-hmm. of them, um, I'm just going to read a couple from the, from the back of it, Pe- names that mm-hmm. probably people will recognize. Um, David mm-hmm. Bluter is thoughtfully positioned to write this pioneering novel about sports betting from Congressman Jim Leach, who my mm-hmm. mother knew well at one time. Um, mm-hmm. uh, David Bluter's novel allows us to see where gambling on sport could lead if we allow it to be unregulated. The Great Gamble shows how the game can be destroyed by greed leaving our children with examples of crime as opposed to appreciation and selflessness from Senator Bill Bradley. Now, he's actually got a pretty important role in in trying to combat um, sports gambling in the past. Mm-hmm. Isn't that, Can mm-hmm. you explain that a little bit? Well, he and Congressman Leach have been the ones that have tried to control sports gambling uh, and the growth of sports gambling, and and they've had a lot of difficulty. But one of the things that they that they actually were able to do is to uh, decrease the amount of offshore betting. Um, and you know, it's not this is stuff isn't just happening in the United States. Um, it's ha- a lot of the bets were done offshore with uh, monies that uh, we may or may not have been able to see. But so what Jim, uh, Jim Leach and Bill Bradley um, actually did was they created a law that disallowed for any credit card use of sports betting over the Internet and offshore. And then as soon as uh, Jim, Jim uh, left – Congress, uh, that law was instantly overturned. Um, Mm. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot of things that that have been going on. And now, um, you know, in 2018, two years ago, uh, the Supreme Court um, then came up with the uh, the decision that states can allow sports betting. And now I think we have 18 states that allow sports betting. Uh, betting as Iowa is one of them. And if you look at the numbers that have uh, come through from just betting from each state, it's just astounding. Um, and then there's more on the way. So a lot of, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the legislation is still, is still going on. So you're going to have sports betting in, in probably just almost every state here very, very soon. Do you think it's, in some ways worse when it's illegal because then crime 
you know, criminals get involved in it, and or is it bad either way? Well, it just increases even crazy. I mean, even more. I think the criminals even get, uh, they're not, they've been backed away. They've, uh, they're yeah. actually just, they're allowing more money to come in on these bets on these specific games. So if you increase the money that's being bet and the payouts that are being bet, that means mm. the illegal stuff has even grown uh, uh, much more advantageous. Oh, wow. So, so David, how did you get all these people to to uh, write testimonials for your book? I mean, there's I just mentioned a couple. There's all kinds of athletes, uh, umpires. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Christopher Merrill's in there. Yeah, yeah. Chris, Sir, Sir Christopher Merrill is the director of the International uh, a writing program in Iowa, and Jim Leach says he's the most uh, profound, prolific uh, professor at the University of Iowa because of what he's able to uh, do for Iowa and to literature for the for the world. So yeah, he uh, he was a, had, had a wonderful, nice thing to say. And in fact, I just picked up last week a gentleman by the by the name of Bob Ryan, and Bob was with the Boston Globe forever, and he was kind of the NBA spokesman uh, for for uh, basketball. He was four-time sports writer of the year. Um, he just came out with a beautiful endorsement last week, so we're pretty excited about that, too. <laughs> so do you oh, know gosh, all these people? Yeah. Um, not all of them. I, I know uh, quite a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> get to know them uh, as, as time goes on and you do more research and you use them in your books and yeah that's kind of the interesting thing about all of them but no not all of them how much research did you have to do for this yeah. um i i started off by doing a lot of research but then i as time went on and you needed to do research uh i kind of took it upon myself about halfway through this thing i, I I listened to went and listened to and met Dennis Lehane, and Dennis, great writer, he did uh, Shutter Island, he did um, uh, Mystic River, uh, The Given Day. He's been a phenomenal writer. He said he took two years off to actually um, historically uh, research for one of his books, and then when he actually was going through his book, he. Um, he didn't use much of it. So what he would do was, as time went on and something came up in the book that he needed to do some research, he then spent that time researching it. So that's kind of how I did it. Um, when I needed, when I thought of a new uh, sub plot, um, I would then think, oh, that's kind of an interesting thing to put in. So then I'd do a little research and spend a week researching it and then uh, start writing about it. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Dave Bluter, author of The Great Gamble, At What Price? Um, we're going to play a little clip from Dave's audiobook. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the production of the audiobook? Oh, absolutely. Um, we have, it was interesting. We, um, I was able to keep the audio rights to the book, uh, and publishing allowed me to do that. And so... Um, I kind of did a little research again and found an actor that was on loan uh, here at the University of Iowa, and he was he actually was a teacher at NYU, uh, NYU School uh, uh, Tisch School, which is an incredible university, and he came over um, with the Grant Woods. Um, uh, I think it was a grant of some kind, but he taught here, and I, I spoke to him, and he decided that he would—he actually wanted to um, uh, narrate this book. So he spent quite quite a bit of time uh, putting it together, and I'm glad to have him. He's been in a lot of different things. He's, you know, he's got a whole list of things that he's been on uh, you know, over the years. So now we've actually put it on. I think there's 64, 65 different distributorships around the world. In fact, we just got something put on in, in South uh, America somewhere. So, uh, wow. You can, find it on, you can find it on Google Play, Google Books, Apple Books, Apple Play. Um, and you can even, even listen to it for up to, you know, listen to a sample or even up to a few hours of it. 
as well. And were you involved in the recording? Not at all. Uh Um, You know, we (laughs) sat and met with the actor, and, and, you know, of course, you read the book, and then he would send me samples of what a character would sound like, and uh, and then maybe ask me a few questions about, you know, what what I thought about specific things. And but most of that, I, then I just let him go. All right. Well, let's take a listen. The Great Gamble by David Bluter, narrated by Joe Osheroff. Chapter 1. Only the strum of the fan could be heard in the suffocating heat. Scott Reynolds held his Glock against his chest and waited before he took a step into the bus barn. Reynolds couldn't pick up his partner's location. Something must have gone wrong. An FBI never turns off his GPS. Scanning the ceiling, Reynolds slipped past one of the buses. But at 5 foot 5 inches tall, he wasn't tall enough to see over the hood. There were dozens of school buses lined up in the warehouse. Two security lights spreading murky shadows along his path. The smell of diesel made his throat sting. His Lilliputian physique topped by a moon-shaped face wore a mosaic of sweat. His clothes, always pressed, without a wrinkle. The top button of his Oxford remained buttoned in the Tucson heat. He touched his phone. Backup was on its way. Everything had been planned. That's the way Reynolds lived his whole life. This was where they were supposed to find the Diablo's drug and weapons ring. He took two more steps and looked both ways. A pigeon cooed as it flew over his head. He continued moving beside the buses, methodical. The air in the warehouse was dead, sucked out like his dreams of redeeming himself. His shoulder grazed a mirror. He kept running it over in his head, a half million dollars of cocaine and heroin just lost in the desert sun. Right under his nose, they would tell him later. His foot slipped on something green, probably antifreeze. His imagination spinning, he heard a Sound. He crept 20 paces, squatted, and leaned against a bus. Peeking around the bumper, he noticed a battery blinking. When he turned the other way, he saw from the corner of his eye a body crumpled on the cement floor. Instinctively, he raced to his partner's side. Kneeling in the blood from the motionless body, Reynolds placed his fingers on Henderson's neck. A pulse could not be found. Chapter 2 Tucson, CNN On Thursday, the FBI released a statement asking for the public's cooperation with their investigation into the murder of Special Agent William Henderson. Henderson, 53, a special agent assigned to Mexican cartels, was found dead on Tuesday inside the Tucson School District bus center on the east side of Tucson, across the street from Arizona Electric. Cheryl Cole, a spokeswoman for the FBI's Arizona field office, confirms Henderson died of multiple gunshots to the head. Anyone with information is asked to call the FBI at 800-CALL-FBI, option 5, 1-800-225-5324. Chapter 3. It was the same old thing. Three dribbles, look up at the hoop, flick his wrist, and the ball was released. He'd already made 129 in a row. A routine Jason Carson loved more than anything else, shooting the basketball. Oak Park's open gym was packed today, just as it was packed last week. Seeing all the college coaches sitting in their roped-off area on the east side of the building was entertaining. Jason glanced over and recognized most of them. Duke, North Carolina, Kansas, Michigan State, Iowa, Virginia, UCLA, Indiana, as well as a bunch of others he didn't know. The gym was filled with shouts, echoes, and the clobbering hammer of basketballs. While Jason's teammate, Dillian Nash, stood underneath the basket, Jason dribbled the ball behind his back, gave Dillian a wink. Watch this, bro. Jason pointed to his eyes and mouth, blindfold. He shut his eyes, took three dribbles, raised his arms, and shot the ball. Nothing but net, fascinated by the sound of snapping nylon as the ball sailed through. Quit showing off, Carson, Dillian joked. Gotta practice, dude, Jason snapped. Nash dribbled between his legs. Project group meets at 4.30, I need an A. Jason stepped back behind the three-point line as he twirled the ball in his finger. He took a step up to the line, jumped back, and let a shot fly, and then turned to face Nash as the ball floated through the air. Nobody really cares about chemistry, he quipped while the ball sailed through the net. Bullshit, I'm trying to get into an Ivy League. Jason tried not to look at the visiting coaches again, but he couldn't help himself. They had come from all over the country just to watch him. He reached over at a loose ball, pounded it against the floor, straightened, crouched down, his eyes looking at his size 17 Jordan Jumpman pros, took two dribbles, slashed to the hoop and elevated into the air while his body twisted 360 degrees and dunked it. Hanging onto the rim, he waited until the ball rolled away and then landed like a panther onto the court. He looked around, picked up another ball, dribbled a bit and then flipped it into the ball cage and gave a quick wave to the coaches. He knew NCAA rules didn't allow coaches to talk to him during the evaluation period, but all those eyes were on him and he adored it. 
Chapter 4. Jason pushed the elevator button for the third floor of Oak Park General Hospital just outside Chicago. His head touched the cracked ceiling. The doors closed. Two nurses stared at him. It was the same old thing, the looks. That was what women did around Jason Carson. They stared. He was 18, with blue eyes deeper than the summer sky and shoulders that must have been handed down by a Greek god. His beardless cheeks and chin scarcely needed a razor, and hair the color of the sand after the ocean waters recede. People watched him, whether on the court or off. The elevator rattled to a stop. Doors opened. This was the third time he'd been late today, including his ACT prep session. He lowered his head and darted out of the elevator and jogged down the hallway towards room 327. Couldn't they just let her come home? Hospitals. He hated them almost as much as he hated schoolwork. The smell, not of disinfectant so much, but the stench of anxiety. His stomach moaned. He was hungry again, always hungry. He slowed down in front of her room, took a deep breath. He squinted, ducked his head, moved in. The overhead light flickered. Jason's mother took a moment before smiling. He tried not to look at the tube in her nose and monitor swallowing her. He hated to see her this way, all flimsy and shallow, like a ghost that could float away with a small breath of wind. A tray of food sat on the table next to her bed, untouched. A silver bedpan sat next to the food. There were flowers stuffed in every available space, carnations, roses, azaleas. Even the seat next to her bed held a yellow mum, new since yesterday. Another church member, no doubt. Jason knelt down next to her. How you feeling, Ma? Little weak, but better now you're here. She reached through the metal sidebars and placed her hand on his forearm. How'd you do on the history test? Two NBA scouts who practiced today. A white-haired woman with milky skin snored and wheezed at the other end of the room. Her voice was as anxious as the expression on her face. What about the tutor, Jason? You call her? I put on a show for him, Ma. Scored 38 in the scrimmage. Showed him my new corkscrew dunk. She tried to sit up. You need to work on your studies, son. He brushed it away with a flick of the hand. Thought you were getting a single room this time. Medicaid is going to pay. We can't afford any luxuries. Wait till I make it big. You'll have the best room. You'll have the penthouse. <laughs> You're dreaming again. I'll talk to the doc. He comes to all my games. His kid Ashton's in my math class. Her face was as bleached as the pale walls. Hope I won't be in here long this time. Starting chemo tomorrow, then maybe I can go home. She ran her tongue over her lips. Bills keep adding up. He had spent a half hour opening all of them last night. The MRI thing was crazy money. Don't worry, I'll pay for it. NBA's gonna make us millions. Hush that talk, honey. Maybe I'll just die, then the bills will stop. No, God wouldn't do that to him. He leaned in towards her. He knew the odds weren't in his favor, but she was too young to leave him. Ma, cut it out. This sort of crazy talk was happening more than he could take lately. He ran both hands through his hair. That haircut would have to wait until next week. 20 bucks, shit. Standing, he stuck his head outside the room, looked down the hall, and saw no one. No way was he talking to the doctor again. He didn't want to hear any more about how the ovarian cancer was back. He moved back into his seat. Trembling, she patted the top of his hand. He shivered again. I have a $50 bill inside the family Bible. Not the one on the coffee table. The one next to my bed. 23rd Psalm. There's a 50 in there, but only for an emergency. Last five years have been an emergency. Hush she said as her face calmed. Jason had seen that look before and it frightened him. Don't worry, son. God always has a way of providing in time of need. Jason reached over for her sandwich and took a bite. Problem is, we're always in a time of need, he said with a laugh. What I love about you is your honesty. You're always telling the truth, but don't lose your faith, son. We've got a lot to be thankful for. Jason studied the tray of food. You gonna eat any of that jello? She shook her head. Mind if I have that roll? She nodded then coughed. Spittle oozed down her chin. Jason bent down and wiped it away. Son, you've been blessed with many gifts. Remember to use them wisely. He stood and looked at her, remembering how beautiful his mother had once been. Now someone must be playing a trick on him. Those gray lips and lifeless eyes. I think it's time for me to use some of those gifts. All right, so we're back speaking with Dave Bluter, author of The Great Gamble, At What Price? And Dave, you... Um, this is published by Ice Cube Press, and we've done quite a few authors from Ice Cube Press over the years. Um, how did you find this is a you know a, um, an Iowa-based press, Steve Semkin? Um, how did you get in touch with him? Um, my editor uh, thought very highly of Ice Cube Press. That he's been doing a lot of work 
He's done a lot of work for um, people that have come out of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, he's well known. He's had a lot of experience. Um, and and uh, I actually knew his wife, and he kind of got interested in the story. Um, and with that, he, you know, he kind of kept talking to me over the years. And finally, I think uh, we were close to getting ready to, to publish it. And so uh, at that time, then I sent it to him. And the rest is history. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, Mom, I know when you were reading this that you did what you often do with a book that has a complicated plot uh, where you would write down the characters and sort of keep track of what was happening with them because it does skip back and forth between the characters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. talk yeah. to us a little bit, Bill, about... Um, how you go about laying out the plot and keeping track of what's going on with the characters. I, uh, I'm really plot oriented. And so I had this idea, uh, about, you know, what could actually could happen. And, and then as time goes on and as you write, there's two different ways to kind of go about things. There's some writers that'll sit down and they'll map out everything, they'll plot it out. I took a class um, from actually a, a uh, alumnus of the Iowa Writers Workshop from the Iowa uh, Summer Writing Festival, and she said they never talk about plot when it comes to the workshop. You just start with characters oh. and off they go. And oh. so I was kind of somewhere in between. I I wanted to have a plot. I wanted to have something about a specific thing. But as time went on, you know, you'd sit and write, and then you'd think about it, and then all these other ideas would come up. You know, what if it actually were to happen? Or, you know, you might talk to someone uh, during the day about something crazy. So all these other things would happen and occur and come to your mind while you're in the shower, and then things would develop as I would write. And that was kind of more fun for me because – I just, it, 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 I didn't know what was going to happen. And even at times when we would go through, you know, this, as one of my editors would say, it just takes piles and piles and piles of pages, which I didn't really ever want to hear when I started. But, um, <laughs> you know, when we went through that thing, and as you go through it, you think, oh, maybe what if this took place with this character, this could change how this whole thing. So, you know, it was kind of an exciting thing because you didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> so even though you thought you did, in the end, you, <laughs> did the end surprise you? I did. And in fact, I, I had like two or three endings. Um, and, you know, with publishing, we've always thought maybe it'd be kind of fun to just throw another ending out there someday or something. <laughs> you know. But it's very, you know, screen worthy. You know, if this thing takes, you know, if it moves to another kind of media medium, uh, you know, it would it could easily be a series for, a, you know, a streaming network. Mm. Wow. So, um, yeah. So, Mom, tell us a little bit about as you were reading it. You know, how what are some of the things that you noted? Well, the, some of the characters were, of course, more interesting than others. But uh, the one, the one gentleman who was, uh, I believe, he was a referee, and he was in, he was uh, in, he was weird. <laughs> he was in the uh, <laughs> because he he was Good. had interest Good. in the he had <laughs> interest in the occult, right? Yeah. That that was yeah. the guy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you yeah. never knew what in the world he was going to do because he would mm -hmm. listen to all these other. All these other things, you know, and that, but yet he was supposed mm -hmm. to be uh, making calls so that certain per, certain uh, team would win. I don't see. I don't. I don't understand how you do that. How you get away with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, the mm -hmm. audience sees what happens that are there, don't they? And you know, how does yeah, that how work? How do they get away with it? I mean, you'd think they wouldn't get hired if they did it too much. Well, uh, yeah, that's a great question. There's and there's two answers to it. One is um, it, you don't have to win a hundred percent of the time. Uh, 
you can make millions and millions. And in fact, I did a uh, show called House of Cards. It's a national show on 140 some different channels across the United States. And they said they understood it completely. But I said, you know, you don't have to win all that. You've won 40, you win 55% of the time. You can become a millionaire in three years. Uh, so you don't have to win every game. Uh, if you win 55, if you win 60, it's almost, if you win 60, you just be, you'd just be amazed how much money you can make in, in sports betting. So that's one thing. You don't have to win every game. The other issue is point shaving. And the shaving means you don't have to win the game. Um, every game, every sport, every, and then they also have prop bets. That's the third thing. But you don't have to win every game. So if you say the, the Lakers are going to play the 76ers and the actual bet is that the Lakers are going to win by 14 points. You could put a million dollars on the Celtics, and if they lose by 13 points, uh, if they only, or the, yeah, so they only lose by 13, you're going to win a million dollars. But they still won. And that's the issue. And then you can bet prop bets. So, for example, you know, is this kid that's going to uh, – is he going to make the next, next basket? You know, how, how many seconds or how many minutes is the national anthem going to be at the Super Bowl? What, you know, what dress is so-and-so going to wear? How many times are they going to say, the, you know, the weather? and Whatever. There's, you know, there's a million bets per game, and they're called prop, prop bets. And uh, people are making money on that as well. That, that is just wild, I'm telling you. It, it is. really is. It's crazy. <laughs> but back to the to the referee who's shaving points by making bad calls, mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like it would be that hard for someone to figure out well what the what the line, what the Vegas line was, what the point spread was, and mm-hmm. and note a pattern. Well, when this ref is is refing that point spread gets, um, they beat the spread. It, more, but more they ref, they're, they're, ref, they're, refereeing, they're refereeing every night, and he might do it once out of four games. Mm. And he might, you know, and again, uh, if he wins it 60% of the time, that's amazing. He doesn't have to win it 80 or 90. So it's just, it's just very, very slight, very, very small. You can put somebody on the bench, you know, a great player, and put him on the bench. Or, you know, player could fake an injury or say he was injured and then ends up playing. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Oh, I think it would be, yeah, it would be pretty easy for a player to do it. And, of course, um, do you think that that when that happens, are they? is it because the players are betting themselves or their family members are betting, or is it like this whole conspiracy like in the book? Uh, it's actually true. There's a, uh, there's, there's a gentleman that was in one of the families, five families in New York City's mob. His name is Michael Franzese, uh, Franzese, excuse me, Franzese, and he was in Goodfellows. Uh, he's actually uh, spoken about, he goes around the country and speaks to, to student athletes and tells them and coaches and, and referee, he goes around the country to each school and he tells them that this stuff happens all the time. He says, Oh, well, we used to do it all the time. He said, I fly around on my airplanes, my helicopters. I had, you know, 17 guys working for him and we'd find a player, you know, like Jason Carson, we'd find somebody that needed money. We'd, so we'd follow him around and we'd say, you know, good, nice to meet you. We buy him a beer. We get to know him, and then we give him ten grand. He goes, five grand wasn't enough. We give him ten grand. We'd say, you know, we want the game to be ten points instead of fifteen, and they'd make it that way. And then we get ten grand, and then he was stuck for the rest of his life, as the book shows. Wow. Oh, gosh. Wow. Oh gosh. <laughs> and probably even more often than that is a situation where fans slip star athletes a hundred bucks here a couple hundred bucks there you know what like happened in the at the restaurant in uh to jason Mm -hmm. that must Mm -hmm. that must happen a lot yeah the hundred dollar handshake's been going on for years um you know sports illustrated uh, came up with something a couple years ago i think it was the mississippi or mississippi state they had you know these kids would go over to 
the booster's house and the grandma would say, get, you know, take this out of the, take this out of the attic and set up my Christmas tree and she'd give, you know, 3000 bucks to do oh, it. And, you know, yeah. People would, you know, people would just give them a job, you know, you just say, oh, you give them a job and they'd go fishing and you'd give them 10 grand. And, you know, it's just happened over and over. Right? Wow. And it, hap- it has happened and continues to happen. Wow. Do you get... In fact, in <laughs> fact I mean, uh, uh, you know, the Pelicans has, you know, the player of the year that went to Duke and his stepfather took 50,000 bucks from uh, from a shoe dealer or from, I think, Adidas or somebody. And, you know, but that's a whole other subject. That stuff, some of that stuff's documented. Some of it they just try to uh, not talk about. Does this make you cynical about sports? It does. In fact, it, yeah, it does. In fact, Dan Gable is, uh, uh, you know, he's one of the endorsers in the book, and he says that's had been happening in wrestling for years. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, so you're working on another book, and you have other books lined yeah. up after that? I, well, I have one more after that. I have uh, another book that, you know, the third one I've kind of been plotting out a little bit about uh, um, Christianity and females and uh, how that's kind of been looked at over the years. And I kind of have my own thoughts about some of that. And uh, I kind of like to want to uncover some things and, and maybe, maybe make that as another thriller as well. Oh, that sounds interesting. Well, we're about out of time, and I want to thank you so much for being with us today, David. Well, it's been my pleasure, and I appreciate the opportunity Mm -hmm. to be on with you ladies. And, Mom, do you have some closing words? (laughs) Well, it's kind of, I was kind of hard coming up with something, but I just, I'm going to say we cannot control someone's, uh, what they do or, or what they think, but we just, need to try our best to walk on righteous paths ourselves, setting a good example. Mm. Mm. It's beautifully said. I really like, I really like that. Yeah. Thank it's you. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Mom, and see you all next week on Writer's Voices.